to our midweek Bible study. Once again, we account this a special privilege that we have to gather together and look into the Word of God to see what He might have for us today. As an unbeliever, He will have the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. As the believer, He will have the message that without prayer, there is no power for the believer. So we trust and pray that we will ask the Lord to open our ears, make our heart receptive, and receive the message that he has for us today. You know, I want to look at prayer instructions. Prayer instructions are instructions for prayer. You know, throughout the Word of God, we find the many wonderful promises that are given to encourage us, the believer, to pray. Jesus himself said, these do not take place except through fasting and prayer, talking about a particular situation. There are situations in our life that must, absolutely must, be brought to pass only as an answer to prayer. And the Bible encourages us throughout the importance of prayer. And these promises also come with excellent instructions on how to pray effectively. We look at a verse tonight that gives an example of both instruction and promise. Matthew 7, 7. Ask. Now all of these are action words, meaning must be continuous. Paul had said, pray without ceasing. Now that does not mean to go around all day long in prayer, 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 prayer. But that means to have an attitude where daily you are praying as the Holy Spirit touches your heart, as he brings to your heart that need of a prayer for someone, for a certain time in your life, for a certain need in your life. It comes upon your spirit by his spirit, the need to pause and pray. That's what the Bible means, you see. Now, as I said, this verse gives us an example of both instruction and promise. Now, isn't our Lord wonderful? Isn't it? Not only did he give these wonderful promises, but he gives us the instruction on how to pray in a way that we can obtain these promises. Oh, how gracious God is to us, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the Bible said we have not because we ask not. We ask and we receive not because we want to bring it upon our own lusts. So it's very important. We find time after time after time after time in the Bible that God worked a miracle, granted a victory, provided blessings only as the result of answered prayer. How often do we worry and are we nervous about something when Paul said in everything by prayer let your request be made. Oh what a what a tragic time it is when most of the time we look everywhere except where we ought to look and we'll seek to find the answer everywhere except we ought to look, and that's to Jesus, and that's to the Word of God. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. It's very important, of course, not that we pray, but we pray effectively. We pray effectively. I want you to, to look 
and see in this particular verse. The first thing that we read here in Matthew is that we have to learn to pray humbly. Ask and it shall be given you. The word ask literally means to ask as an inferior, not as an equal. We need to realize, ladies and gentlemen, until we come to the place to realize that we're not going to deserve, uh, we're not going to uh, demand. It indicates taking an humble position before the person you're asking for favors. And who are we asking for favor? We're asking for God. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 10. Humble yourselves. What does that mean? In the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Pride negates a prayer even before or while it's being prayed. God has no obligation to answer our prayer, but because he's a gracious father, because he's a loving father, because he's a prayer answering God, he simply wants us to come before him, not in demand, not in telling him how we believe that he ought to answer the prayer. We're coming to him as a needful child. We're coming to him in that humble spirit of realizing he's the only one that can provide what we're asking for. If we could have that which we are asking for on our own merit, we'd have no need to come to the Father. But the Bible said, He that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth liberty and upbraideth not. But it's the spirit in which we come, you see, true prayer is coming humbly to the Lord, acknowledging our deficiency and seeking his help. Now, what does that mean? We have to come knowing and realizing what we're asking is beyond our ability to provide or to secure. And that we're coming in that spirit to ask our Heavenly Father according to his will. Letting our request and our needs be made known to him. And knowing that he doeth all things well. And to pray as Jesus prayed. This is what I'd like, but not my will, but thy will. That's what he's talking about. You see, true prayer acknowledges God's superior position and purpose and person. Look at Mark 12, 32. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. You see, that's what humility understands. There's nobody like God. And if God doesn't answer, it can't be answered. Then number two, look back at that verse. Secondly, he said, seek. Now, seek means to look diligently or to strive for something. You know, the Lord knows that if we simply want a temporary relief by obtaining, obtaining that answer, or is it really something, something that needs to be provided or corrected and we're going to continue Continue, pray about it until the Lord says yes or no. And we're going to be looking at how he answers instead of how we expect him to answer sometime. You see, we must pray earnestly. Earnestly praying is not going through the motions or repeating some phrase or prayer over and over again in vain repetitions. 
Real prayer should be a burden that I'm going to continue till God addresses that burden either by answering it and providing it or giving me the grace to accept it as it is and go on. Mm. Listen to me again. Listen to me again. The Bible said that prayer, look at Matthew 6, 7 and 8. But when you pray, literally means as you pray, assuming that you are a believer of prayer. Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. You know, it's not the length of the prayer, but it's the faith of a prayer, the emotional of a prayer. Look at it. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Don't you remember the story of the Old Testament, how the prophets of Baal? Don't you remember how they cried out there when the prophet had challenged them? For their God to answer. They screamed. They cut themselves. And what happened? Fire came down from heaven and consumed them. You see when you come before the Lord. In prayer. The first thing he looks at. Is your heart. Is this real? Is this genuine? Is it important enough for them. That they'll continue. To come forth. Seeking the answer, whether it is that God will bring that to pass, or as Paul said, he prayed three times that he would have that infirmity passed, and the Lord told him, No. And then he accepted it. So it'll either be victory or grace to go through it. But not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. It is to be effectual, fervent prayer that God answers. James chapter 5, verse 16b. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effective, fervent comes from the Greek word that gives us our English word, energy. You have to put some energy into your prayers. That's time and effort. Well, now, Lord, I need this, and I, I'm looking forward to it. No, it means to get down. First of all, to come before the Lord and confess our sin and to praise Him for who He is, to give Him glory for what He does, and to tell Him that we're thankful and grateful that we have a Savior and a God as we do. Thank Him for His everlasting love. Thank Him for His forgiveness. Thank him for his long suffering. Give him the praise that he needs. Instead of just coming immediately and say, I need, I need, I need. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Pay him, pay him the praise that he's needed. I see effective praying in the Bible is where those that were effective. The effective favorite prayer of a righteous man was they gave God the glory and praised him and thanked him before they began to even ask something. Think about it. Think about it. You have to put some energy into your prayers, times and effort. Time and effort. Because it is not a three minute inquiry with God. In fact, let me encourage you, when you come to prayer, take a moment of silence before you even start. Just be silent before the Lord for a short time. And look at your own heart. Look at your own spirit. Look at you and where your relationship is with the Lord. Don't just come and burst out. Show the reverence and the appreciation, love, and respect for God. 
then announce Him as your God and praise Him. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Honor Him. Honor His name. Give Him praise. Give Him glory. Give Him love. There is no God like our God. He is the God of gods. There's none other. He's the God of creation. And we praise Him for who He is. Think about that. Think about that. And the Bible tells us, give Him the time that He needs to be honored. So many times we just run in. And Lord, here I am. I just, I, I got to have this and everything. And I, you know, that this three minute prayer is why we're in the problem we are. Three minute prayer that was a real prayer is worth more than a 30 minute prayer that meant nothing and just a bunch of words. He said, when Peter with a need and an honest heart was sinking, he said, Lord, save me. He got to it. He identified Lord. He gave him the glory. His faith was in the Lord. You see, he addressed the Lord before even a crisis prayer was offered. Let me say to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's super, super important that we recognize who we are approaching for prayer. Almighty God. The God of creation. The God of salvation. The God of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Then we treat him like somebody that's a neighbor or something or on our casual speaking terms. Think about that. Peter was in a crisis of his life. He was drowning, but yet he acknowledged who the Lord was and that his faith was in the Lord that only the Lord could save him. He gave Jesus the praise that he deserved even in that crisis. How many times have we went to prayer and all it was was give me, give me, give me, give me or remove this or remove this or give me this or give me this. Not even pausing just for a moment to show the reverence and love for whom we have the authority to approach the throne of grace boldly. Sometimes I myself, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to confess I feel like my prayer was unjustly started when I failed to give the Lord the glory and the praise that was due Him. There's nobody in my, my life or will ever be in my life that's been as good to me as God is. There's no one ever done. While there have been people who have blessed me, no one could ever bless me like my father has. Oh, dare me to rush in without giving him the praise and the glory that's due his name. We've become so familiar. We fail to realize when we come into His presence, we're in the presence of God Almighty. None like Him. He's the only God. He proved it over and over. How dare us, our Father which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Isn't it amazing Jesus said when you start your prayer, Lift up the name of the Father. Lift up the name of Almighty God. Give Him praise. Give Him glory. Humbly bow before Him and thank Him for the gift of all gifts as a believer. And that was Jesus Christ for your salvation. Thank you for the provision that He's provided for you. The protection He's put you under. The family He's given you. Give Him glory. Give Him praise. 
Somehow, I don't know, we've got to work. Are we ashamed to praise God? Are we ashamed to give Him the honor and glory? God forbid if we are, how wretched we are. There'll never be anybody, even though there's been a lot of wonderful people put in our lives, family and friends. No one can take the place of Jesus. No one. Oh, how that. Think about that. Think about that. Then thirdly, he says, knock and it shall be open to you. We have to pray persistently. The tense of the words knock, ask and seek in the present tense means to keep on. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Knocking illustrates that we are to keep on praying repeatedly until the door is open. Too often we give up quickly in our prayer. We pray once or twice and then quit. Yet as we've seen, God checks our sincerity by observing just how persistent we are in praying about something. Is your prayer, is my prayer, a right request from a heart that should not let us quit praying? We should have a heart burn until the answer comes from God. James chapter 4 verse 2 C. Yet you have not because you ask not. Do we pray humbly, earnestly, persistently? If not, then we know why many times our prayers might not be answered. Father, help us today with the importance of prayer. You said, he that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth liberty and upbraideth not. You desire for your children to ask, to knock, and to seek. You desire because you're a prayer answering God. And how much extra we suffer because we fail to pray or we don't take time to understand the privilege and sincerity of praying right. It's just got going through a bunch of words. It's first of all having a heart for God's will. And a heart that will accept your will. Sometimes we don't pray because we're afraid that you might answer it different. Forgive us for that, Lord. Help us to have the spirit that Jesus has. We'd like this, Father, but nevertheless, if it's not your will, then change our will. Bless this time of instruction on how to pray and help your children pray. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a great time. In his name we ask. Amen.